plot for uh, just a moment for integrated photonics. And then um, later on, we will learn about how to mold the flow of light, right? How to make components and eventually circuits out of that. Um, great, but maybe it's good. It's a good time to check whether anything, you know, dissipate into your minds uh, from yesterday's lecture, right? So I will ask the same question. What is the loss of an optical fiber? And I want only the students to answer. No, no teaching, staffs, no seniors. Loss of an optical fiber, easy peasy. You. Excellent. Okay, that's a good guess. It's 0. 0.25 dB per kilometer. What is the loss of a silicon waveguide? Anybody paying attention? Around 3 dB per centimeter. Really good. You made my day. Excellent. Something sticks. Okay, um, thank you for that. So let's uh, take a look at where we stopped yesterday about losses, right? And then we were analyzing this kind of uh, equation or formula. Uh, can anybody help me explaining what it is? So I see it as a recipe, let's say, to make low loss waveguides. We want that. But what is really the recipe? Anybody? Show of hands, you? One recipe. There are three, three ingredients for this recipe. One, two, three, mention one. What to do with surface roughness? Yeah. Yeah, memperhalus, smoothing of interfaces. That's one. Another one of the recipe, anybody? The middle and the right one? Yes. Yeah, what to do with index contrast? Okay, so lower index contrast waveguides typically have lower losses. Great. Last one, last one. Any taker in the middle? Anybody? The one in the plate shirts, we are the same. So, no? Yes. So mode profiling, really good. So if you can shape the mode not to touch the, 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 the side walls, then it's good. Great. Amazing. Now, next, the mechanism of losses in curved waveguides, you have additional loss because then uh, the effective index of the mode actually changes as you go away uh, uh, from the center of the curvature. And then we have been looking at this graph and deducing that, okay, if you have a certain kind of index contrast, for example, silicon has high index contrast, you can actually bend it really, really sharp. But then if you have a rather blobby waveguide, like a, like a doped silica, for example, with an index contrast of half a percent or 1%, then you end up with this kind of uh, bending radius. So you have the sense of, okay, the choice of material would be determining a lot of stuff, right? The choice of material, the choice of structure will determine how you can mold your circuit. Before going into that, let's have a look at that uh, one. And this is a persistent problem, right? So just imagine that well, I'm not saying that my lab is like the most advanced, but we are pretty advanced in integrated photonics. But coupling light into these chips still pose a lot of problems, right? So the idea is like this. Um, you have your circuit. Your circuit has components, ring resonators, splitters, and so on and so forth. It's sitting in one chip. That's pretty good. But most of the time, your laser source and your detector are sitting somewhere else, right? And there are connections via optical fibers that you need to make to launch laser light into the circuit 
and into your detection or spectrometer or spectrum analyzer, whatever you want to call it, right? And then there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, and later on, you will see there is a mismatch of the modes, the intensity profile of an optical fiber, which is rather standard. So I'm not going to make my own optical fiber. Typically, I buy this from Tor Labs, let's say, uh, with the material that I'm using. The material that I'm using uh, typically depends on what I choose and then the modes that are um, made here are a bit more arbitrary. So you have something standard going and then uh, something arbitrary. So let me explain a bit about this picture, right? So this is called, um, uh, well, this is part of a positioner. So this is a top view image and this is the chip. The chip is this big right and then typically you want the chip to sit and then this one is called a chuck right where uh, your sip uh, your your chip sit there right typically a chuck has holes underneath so you make a metal you drill holes right and then you um, uh, uh, apply vacuum so if you apply the vacuum then it will suck up the chip to sit completely on the chuck. So you don't have a, a you know, change in position, right? So that's, that's why you, you need to have this kind of a, a, a slung um, tube, let's say, to create the vacuum. Okay, another part is to establish input and output. This is a canonical um, um, coupling system, let's say, where the input and the output are on opposite side, right? So um, that means that this is an input waveguide, some circuit and output waveguide. You need to bring in one fiber to interface with one side and the other, right? But this is not by any means the only way to do this, right? Later on, you will see, or maybe later on in your academic life later, you will see that um, a chip can also have both input and output at the same side, right? In this case, you need to bring in an array of optical fiber to interface only with one side. So that's the advantage. You need to interface only with one side. By the way, if you have questions, just mention it, then I will answer it, right? Okay, what else? So this is just a, a groove. So there's a metal plate with a groove, and then you lay your optical fiber such that it is inside this channel so it doesn't move. And this is just a magnetic uh pin or disc let's say that you put to keep the fiber uh, uh aligned let's say straight yeah the same on the other side and then of course this is part of an actuator that you can do uh, uh let's say x y oh, x y and z let's say three dimensional uh, uh movement and also rotation so Sometimes you have a six coupling, five, six axis, five axis, or three axis stages. And then you need to align the mode of the fiber such that it couples into the waveguide and back. And that is difficult. It's not so easy. But this is something that we always have to uh, face when you start working with a photonic chip. So typically, if I have a student, I send them to the to the lab and then let them be frustrated for a few days. But then this frustration give, give resilience, give experience to the student uh, so that they can, uh, they can uh, yeah, be good at this. Okay, so what is the problem? The problem is that optical fiber has super big mode, right? Because then the, 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 the diameter of the core of an optical fiber is nine or 10 micron. That's a single mode, standard single mode fiber. Silicon waveguide, on the other hand, has really high uh, index contrast. And this is a one-to-one -one comparison between the mode of an optical fiber and here in the center, the mode of a silicon waveguide. So you see the problem. The problem is that to align this big mode into this small mode, will uh, create losses, 
because then most of the intensity here will not be coupled here, right? So you need some sort of technique to mitigate this. Otherwise, let's say 90% of the light coming from your laser will be lost, right? And I'm highlighting now three different ways that typically um, uh, many labs or even industries um, are implementing these techniques, right? The first one is called butt coupling. You butt it, right? So you imagine that this is your chip. You come with the fiber and then you align it such that it touches the chip, right? This is called butt coupling. You can do that if there is mode matching between the fiber and the chip. If if you don't if you if you do that with this kind of mismatch, then you will have a lot of loss. The other one is to use a lens tip fiber. So a fiber that is equipped with a lens that focuses the light. And then if you control this distance between this lens fiber with the waveguide, that you can transform the focus, the 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 diameter of the mode, let's say, from a 10 micron into around 2 micron. So it's better now. It matches a bit more with the cross-section of your optical waveguide. And then the final one is using vertical grating coupler. This is a bit, I mean, like, if I see this, great. If I this, see this, makes sense. If I see this, initially I thought, huh, why? Right, because it seems very flimsy, and you know it's unnatural. But a lot of people are doing this at this moment. Why? First, um, you can actually tailor the grating. So, what does the grating do? The grating is coupling a mode that is propagating, like horizontally in the waveguide, into the one that is radiated vertically, right? And vice versa. So, you can actually launch laser light here. And then the grating will convert some with some loss, let's say, to the guided mode or the other way around. The guided mode can, uh, can be transferred into the fiber via this vertical coupling, right? So you can have a lot of <clears throat> tailoring using this grating. But one that is very powerful is actually that imagine if you have a wafer. We talk about the wafer, right? So the whole many, 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 many chips are built into a single wafer, right? So how do you get the chip in a wafer? How? You cut it up, right? This is called singulation. So the, 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 the chip are singulated or diced. It's a dicing method, right? So you can imagine if I want to access the sides, I have to dice it up. I have, all the, I, I, I have to get the chip from the wafer, right? But if I'm doing vertical coupling, you can imagine if I have a wafer, I can come with a fiber and then just scan over the fiber. So this is wafer scale testing. And wafer scale testing is preferred by the industry because dicing things that doesn't work will cost a lot of or will waste money, right? So they want to be sure first that every device is working in the in in the wafer and dice it up and then sell it so that's the that's the argument okay um side coupling right uh, we already agreed that there is a mismatch between the waveguide mode and the fiber mode so you have to do something about it and this is called tapering right so the idea of a taper is to adiabatically transfer the waveguide mode into a mode at the side of the chip that fits the fiber mode better. That's the idea of tapering, right? So you can imagine that uh, the first, for me, the first um, 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 instinct is I want to make the mode bigger. I make the waveguide bigger. Great instinct, right? So this is done using this kind of, uh, there are various types of taper. This is the most excessive and expensive one, right? So you, you change from this small cross-section into a bigger one, right? So you can imagine that I have to funnel this in 3D from big to small, 
right? So what does it mean? It means that from the this height, h1, I have to taper into this height, h2. And from this width, width 1, I have to taper, taper into width 2, right? This is called 3D tapering. Can you do something else? You can. So for example, that if I don't want to do the height tapering, and I will tell you later why, um, I taper from this uh, waveguide into this waveguide, right? So I have, uh, wait, so I have this, yeah? And then I don't taper the, the I don't taper the, the, the height, I just taper the width. So this is, this is called a lateral, lateral taper. So you might ask why the difference, right? The difference is that uh, it's, not, it's not the same changing height and width. Anybody know why? Yes. Can you elaborate? Let's discuss this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 going towards that. Uh let me let me rephrase it, let's say. To change width, you just have to design and then etch it. Right? So to go from from this width to this width, you do some sort of structuring which is okay, right? But then to change height of the layer, you really have to do something in the deposition, right? And of course, your, your, your comment is that, yeah, okay, but etching is causing this kind of side wall roughness, and that. but once you have a good recipe for the etching, you can implement it for all kinds of width and so on and so forth. But deposition sometimes, or most of the time, is is not a desire to have different thickness in different part of your layer or your chip. For example, if you want to make a silicon with guy, what do you get? You get, we discussed about this, eh? you have a silicon uh, substrate, and then you have box, which is SiO2, and typically you already have your silicon, which is around 220 nanometer. There is no height variation there. You cannot add, you can sub subtract, but then, yeah, then your, your waveguide will be too thin, right? So in this case, where you don't have control of the thickness of your material, you don't want to do this. You want to do this, right? So tapering becomes something that is very useful, but also very challenging for foundries. So when you talk about, so I'm a user, of foundries, so I regularly go to them and then ask, what do you have, right? Oh, we have waveguides with this uh, much loss and so on and so forth. We have uh, ring resonators that can be tuned, blah, 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 effective index is blah, 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 great. What is the coupling to your fiber? And then they say, well, you know, it's still high. You lose half of your light each time you're coupling to the, to the, to the, to the chip and back, right? Why is that? Yeah, tapering is expensive. It is an expensive process. It's an extra step, right? So that's why this kind of 3D taper, sometimes people don't want to do it. There are, uh, each foundry has their own way of tapering. Um, and then that is what sets them apart. Sometimes uh, people, I, I, I've spoken to people that makes quantum computers based on light. Uh, we use, we share the same technology, and then they say, yeah, okay, the propagation loss is pretty good, but now our problem is the losses coming from fiber to chip, right? So this is still something that is very, very relevant to tackle in integrated optics. Another one, another way that is not so intuitive in the beginning is that to taper it, you taper it down, right? Instead of making your waveguide bigger, you make it super small. 
what happens there? So it needs two, two ingredients, right? The first one is that you need to taper down your waveguide into almost nothing, right? And then you need to encapsulate it with a low index material like polymer and so on and so forth, SU8. And why? Because then if you actually make the waveguide almost nothing, you blow it up. The mode becomes like radiating into the surrounding, right? But then that if you encapsulate it with some uh, low index material, you still have waveguiding because then you have contrast between this low index material and air. And then the mode can be tailored to match the mode of the fiber. So this has been implemented also a lot in foundries, right? So if you talk about tapers, be sure you know which tapering that you get from the foundries. Any question? So far, so good? All right. Um, so this is just some photos of um, this is a company in Germany uh, that works with the foundry that I work with, Lionix. And then I got these slides from these people showing that indeed they do tapering, inverse tapering. So I forgot to mention that this is called lateral or vertical or 3D tapers. And this one is inverse because it's inverse of what you thought it would be, right? Instead of making it bigger, you're making it smaller. Okay, so this is just, and the idea is that you have this kind of silicon nitride waveguide that is tapered to be very, very uh, small in width. Thickness is the same, but then very small in width. And then after that, you, you make uh, another waveguide in SU8. So SU8 is a, a rather a low index material, let's say, to encapsulate the silicon nitride waveguide. And this is the cartoon of how they envision it to be, right? So you can have uh, pretty low loss. Okay, then I'm being very imprecise now. What is low and what is high loss? So if somebody said to me, uh, you have a chip and then you can use fiber and then you lose 3 dB, 3 dB is half of your light, then I would say, Mwah, right? It's rather high. If they say it's 1 dB, I would say, okay, I'll take it, right? And of course, these foundries say that they can have half a dB of losses, right? Less than 1 dB per facet, right? But then every photon that you have is precious. So you don't want to lose them. So that's the idea. You have a question? Anybody has a question? Okay, good. Uh, okay, now we talk about the grating couplers, right? The grating couplers, I think, as far as I know, was invented in, uh, let's say, the, the, the real fabrication was done early 2000 in silicon by the group of rule bats in Ken. Don't quote me on that, right? But this will be in YouTube, so people will hear it. Okay, as far as I know. Uh, and why? Because there was a persistent problem with silicon waveguides, right? The silicon waveguide, is super small, the mode. So absolutely, you, you cannot have good matching with optical fibers. So they designed this grating so you can now change the, the, uh, change the waveguide into something a bit bigger, let's say, in terms of the cross-section, just by width tapering, and then etch this grating such that uh, the area of the grating, so how, 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 how many gratings and how big it is, will determine uh, um, overlap with the waveguide mode, right? And then this grating will just uh, couple light up and down. So up will be caught by this optical fiber, but then down will manifest as loss. So what is the problem of the... Somebody has a question? No? Okay. What is the problem with um, uh, this kind of grating coupler? It's a structure. It's a filter, right? So it has... Can somebody finish my, my sentence? It has a limited bandwidth, right? So it doesn't work for all frequencies. It doesn't work for all wavelengths, right? And then the frequency or wavelength selectivity is rather rather severe. So if I 
skip back into these kind of tapers. Oh, sorry. Typically, if I have a broadband light, let's say, all can be coupled as long as they are guided. But then for, for the grating couplers, you have pretty selected bandwidth, let's say. So then you trade that with, uh, with, with the convenience of actually coupling in and out, right? And then the, the, the second one is that, of course, because of these, uh, you have extra losses. So I think the first few ones that was reported, it's like 5 dB per facet. I think they're pushing it down now to 2 dB. Don't quote me on that roughly, let's say. But there are now many elaborated design of how to reuse this light, uh, limit the, the or appetize the grating and so on and so forth. Right, so there are some design parameter that you can do. Good. I don't know what is my next slide. Okay, so um, maybe I said okay. So now we learn about how to couple in and out, and then at least what I want is that you have the flavor, the idea of what are the challenges uh, to work with integrated optics chips, and then coupling in and out. Right. Now we want to 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 move more into materials and structure. I'm not sure whether we can finish with the structure. Uh, I plan to end with a description of ring resonators. If we don't get to that, then it's the next uh, lecture, let's say. But then this just taken from Saleh, right? Uh, the Fundamental of Photonics book. Uh, summarizing again, the type of waveguide we've seen this picture in the in the in the lecture yesterday, you have some strip embedded, rich, rip, strip loaded, whatever you want to do. It's as long as waveguides and it works for you, uh, you can you can have your way, let's say. Uh, but then this is very general, right? Okay, this is the waveguide and so on and so forth. Realism comes when you work with the materials. For some materials, it's impossible to do this or that, right? So the kind of choice of material that you made determine what sort of waveguide that you should make, right? Because of the index contrast, that's one. Because of limitation of how thick your layer can be for silicon nitride with a certain kind of deposition, after some thickness, it cracks. So if you say that, oh, I want to have an LPCVD low loss silicon nitride layer with a thickness of 1.5 micron, good luck, right? Very difficult. There are patterns now actually being implemented to actually make silicon nitride waveguide with a thickness of one micron with low loss eh? because it cracks, right? Um, if you want to make silicon waveguide with a certain kind of losses, yeah, okay, then you got some problem, right? So this is just showing a certain kind of flavor of optical waveguides that have been used. Uh, somebody asked the question online yesterday about lithium niobate, great material, but then uh, typically you have lithium niobate with very big mode area and weakly guiding. Why? Because then it's very difficult to structure lithium niobate so the way you make waveguide is you diffuse titanium to slightly change the refractive index locally for the TMI base such that light can be channeled, can be waveguided, but then the index contrast is pretty low. Uh, these are the type of uh, three, five semiconductor waveguides with multiple uh, layers, let's say, and then typically this is found in active materials. What is active? Yeah, what is active, right? Uh, in, in photonics, typically active, if you can do light generation lasers, you can do light modulation modulators, and you can do light detection detector. Silicon nitride, on the other hand, is completely passive. You can do passive routing, you can do ring resonator, you can bring your uh, uh, photon to travel half a meter, and so on and so forth. That's all good, doesn't generate light, doesn't modulate well, doesn't detect well, right? That's why later on, maybe next week, we will, or maybe already this lecture, we will talk about hybrid integration, where you need to bring many, many 
several different materials to actually carry out a complete function in integrated photonics. Now, this lower one is, let's say, if you already choose a material, you want to use this waveguide into some sort of circuit, right? Uh, so light can go straight, can do bends, can be splitted using this kind of Y junction, can interfere to make a certain kind of filter called Massander interferometer, uh, can be put in one um, uh, uh, input port and then be split it into two output ports and so on and so forth. And then, of course, very important, the workhorse of integrated photonics is the so-called optical ring resonators. We'll all be there. Okay, so let's talk about material. So this just an uh, excerpt, forgot to mention it here, from a PhD thesis of my... Uh, uh, former PC student in Australia, Blair Morrison. Now he's heading the integration uh, department of Sanadu uh, in, um, in Canada. Sanadu is trying to build uh, viable quantum computers and they are now a unicorn, I think. So they got a really big investment and they now grow to be a billion dollar company. So, um, but that's not the point, right? The point is that, okay, uh, you see the variety of waveguide cross-section that you can have with various different materials. For example, if you choose to have silicon waveguide uh, surrounded with a cladding of silicon uh, oxide, then you can have this kind of buried waveguide, some sort of rib, some sort of really uh, deep edge rib, and some white waveguide and so on and so forth. If you choose siliconite, right, as your core material, you can do the same. You can do very thick, you can do very thin, or particularly the ones that we use in, um, in, in Twente together with Lionix is the one that has two cores, right, which is uh, called the double stripe waveguide. It's a bit peculiar, let's say. And then for uh, silicon, you can also have it really thick. So remember that I think I'm write it here that okay you have 220 nanometer of silicon that is i think the silicon wafer that you get for photonics is standard uh you can also get a three micron thick silicon right and actually uh, maybe i have a slide maybe not um, in 1986 that was the birth 1985 the birth of silicon photonics the first person who proposed this is called richard Sorev and Richard Sorev was in Air Force, one of the Air Force research lab in the US. At that time, nobody cares about silicon as a, as a photonic material. They thought, no, okay, this is lossy and not transparent for visible and so on and so forth. But he proposed it. He proposed it such that you can do waveguides, you can do modulators, and so on and so forth. And at that time, the proposal of Richard Sorev was a three micron thick silicon. Uh, waveguide. So silicon started with very thick and then nowadays becomes very thin. Alrighty, so another rehash of the same slide, let's say. So these are uh, a few uh, material. So there are many, many, many photonic materials, right? You name it, aluminum oxide, aluminum nitride, silicon carbide, Silicon oxide, silicon nitride, silicon oxynitride, uh, titanium dioxide, tantalum pentoxide, and so on and so forth, right? Um, why do I recant those materials? Just showing that photonics is at this stage. There is no one choice of material. I think if you go to standard electronics, people just do silicon. That's it. If you go to higher frequencies and et cetera, okay, you do 3-5 material. That's it, right? In photonics, people make waveguides out of everything, right? Um, but of course, we as a community need to go into uh, mature technology. And mature technology, you cannot say that. I have 50 different materials. Please make an industry based on this. Doesn't work. So after, let's say, 20, 30 years of uh, research in integrated optics, it becomes crystallized into only a few different materials that A, 3D mature, 
Pretty mature means that I'm not making it in my own lab with my own recipe, but I go to a foundry. I go to Intel. I go to, you know, IBM sold their their silicon photonics now into global foundries, for example, and so on and so forth, right? And then I have standardized components with low loss, with uh, different different you know components that I can just drag and drop when I'm designing it, almost like electronics, right? And then these materials become uh, indium phosphide, very important to have lasers, modulators, SOA, semiconductor, optical amplifiers. I think the one that makes a real difference between electronics and photonics right now is that you know, in electronics, you have transistors, you have amplifiers, really, really, really mature. But then on-chip amplifiers in photonics is either noisy or not that good, right? So that's really a main difference between having interconnected large-scale circuit. I'm going to shut up for a bit. Yeah? Alles good? Okay, great. So, indium phosphide, the index contrast is okay, 5 to 10%. Um, it's very, very good to make uh, active components. The passive, not so good, right? The type of losses that you get for indium phosphide waveguides are around 3 to 4 dB per centimeter. So, uh, because then if you see it and you say, it's already there's a laser, modulators, SOAs, photodetectors, but the passive routing is bad, right? That's why people don't do everything in 3.5. Some, some group are trying to push this idea. There is, a, there is a company in the U.S. called Infinera that is making transceivers, you know, these pluggables that I've shown uh, yesterday uh, for the data center and et cetera, solely in indium phosphide. But then for other applications, you need other materials. Okay, the other one is silicon on insulator, ultra high index contrast. Remember that for some index contrast, it's just the difference between the refractive index of the core and the cladding material. Some define it like this, right? So be mindful about which definition. If you ask what is the standard, there is no standard. So yeah, we are photonics, so we don't get standardized so much. So uh, 40 to 45% uh, index contrast. So that means that your device becomes really, really small. And of course, if you have very, very, very small device, it's really good for the pluggables, right? If you need to do many, many in data centers, instead of having really big module, you just have it in the pluggables, right? But not only that, right? So silicon on insulator has this kind of allure. Whether that is true or not, we have to think about it. Later on, I have a few slides about that. The allure of silicon is the preferred material for electronics. So you have already the Intel, you already have the IBM, you have already all these kind of um, uh, foundries that produce silicon, right? And then the idea is that can we as young photonics field um, just piggyback on them and then use this huge investment already to actually uh, make our optical waveguides? The answer is, I don't know. Why? The, the short answer is that, well, the layers and then the infrastructure and everything that has been made for electronics in silicon actually doesn't guide light so well, right? So you have to make some sort of choice. I have a few slides later on to talk about this. The other one is uh, silicon oxide, silicon oxynitride scion, and silicon nitride. These are lower index contrast, but ultra low loss, right? So for some applications, you don't need to be very small, right? Uh, if you don't send it into satellites that need super small and so on and so forth, you can live with a bit of size for integrated photonics. But you need it to be low loss because all your photons need to be there, right? That's why there's still a lot of people 
looking at silicon nitride, silicon oxynitride. And then the final one is lithium niobate, mentioned before in the, in the, in the lecture yesterday, that this is a material on the re-rise. It was rising, and then it now rises again because of the, the, yeah, the recipe that is developed by the Harvard group of Marco Longcar to structure the lithium niobate. So this, this is a slide that I borrowed from Jonathan Klemkin, a professor in UCSB, uh, when he was giving uh, a photonic lecture, let's say. So it's from a few years ago. So when he draw lithium niobate waveguide, you see that it's still this kind of titanium indiffused low index contrast waveguide. Nowadays, you can have lithium niobate waveguide with this kind of profile, nanophotonic waveguide, with similar kind of loss as the, this kind of a big mode waveguide. So that's the trick. So once you can do nanostructuring of your lithium niobate, then you enjoy all uh, the benefit. And the main benefit is that it's the best electro-optic modulation material in the world right now. Very mature, very good. Uh, great, okay. Let's step into silicon photonics. Maybe I have to speed up a bit. Okay, so silicon photonics, you have silicon dioxide, just I, what I draw here. You have silicon dioxide uh, substrate, let's say silicon substrate, some silicon dioxide, and then silicon, right? Index contrast is very high, 3.5 to 1.45 or 1.5 for silica. Great. Benefit, high index contrast, you know, the allure of CMOS technology, uh, existing fabs, you can talk about volume, right? Um, it's been developed pretty well. So some passive, some photo detection, uh, high speed modulators based on uh, carrier effects. So you have this kind of accumulation of carriers running around in the semiconductor. And if you can harness that to modulate the reflective index of silicon, you can actually make good modulators, right? But then there's lack of light source, and then the integration of electronics becomes questionable, let's say, because of the fact that thin silicon uh, that has been used for microelectronics, let's say, is not a pretty good way to it. Okay. Oh, I do have a slide. So this is Richard Sorev that has been mentioned before. So this is 1985, right? And he has, a, he has this paper saying, um, uh, single crystal silicon, a new material for 1.3 and 1.6 micron integrated optical components. Before this, it was unheard of. People use glass, glass, glass polymer, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, but then um, uh, Richard was uh, proposing this. Great. Okay, so the high index contrast, we discussed about this, right? Um, I borrowed this from uh, Rulbats and Wim Bogart from uh, IMEC and uh, from Ghent University. Uh, it's a blessing, right? We already mentioned it that uh, because of the high index contrast, you can bend the, the waveguide really, really tightly, right? You can have grating couplers, right? This kind of grating couplers that vertically couple to um, to optical fiber and well you know the, the the loss number that i quoted from early on is already now much better right and then you have uh, compact components uh, you can make photonic crystals you can do sub wavelength gratings and so on and so forth so it's a pretty good mature material platform but of course there is also a curse right we mentioned about losses we analyze this uh, recipe of having low loss waveguide right because of the high index contrast anything that you have roughness in your waveguide is amplified then you have losses due to scattering right and then if you make interferometer because then the the, the effective index of the mode is very high let's say then uh, if you have a bit of error in your uh, waveguide width then you have different effective index and then you have some sort of phase error and then a lot of the the the, the structure inside the waveguide 
is actually interferometric device. A ring is an interferometric device. A mass center interferometer is an interferometric device. So that presents uh, a certain kind of challenge for the uh, for making the circuit. And of course, uh, I didn't mention what this, but then there's a lot. So if you have waveguide, right? You have waveguide. Let's say a snake type of waveguide. Um, and this is your chip, right? Um, you want to uh, couple in light from here. And then you want to receive it here. Right? Um, you say, okay, just butt it here. But then if you butt the fiber into the chip, sometimes you still have gaps, air gap, right? You have small air gap here, right? And then um, if you actually uh, have these gaps, then this kind of waveguide is actually making a Fabry Perot interferometer. So instead of having a transmission like this, you have some dips. And then, of course, the, 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 the distance in frequency, the frequency difference between these dips depends on the optical path length of your waveguide, right? So we've seen this a lot. So typically, if we want to measure a ring resonator, let's say in, out, you expect to have these kind of things. Right later on, you will see, but then actually, what you measure is something like this. And this parasitic five Fabry Perot effect uh, is worse if you have higher index and higher reflection. Okay, still good in time. Okay, so uh, this is just a summary also from a few years ago. Uh, what sort of performance that you can get from a standard silicon on insulator device, typically made in GAN by iMac, right? So the standard waveguide is 450 nanometer by 220 nanometer, um, fabricated us using deep UV lithography, 193 nanometer. So it's not super advanced, but then photonics typically is like that. And then in standard pilot line, 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter wafer. So they are already considering 30 centimeter wafer, which is rather big. So you go to this kind of big wafer if you know that you need volume. If you know that the yield is actually pretty good such that you can make a lot of waveguides, a lot of devices or chips, right? So. This is showing that uh, the, the, the technology is actually maturing, right? Uh, the losses that you get is around 1.8 dB per centimeter. Okay, for some application, it's okay. For my application, it's no good. Um, then the, the question is that, okay, what, what is the origin of this loss? We have discussed about it, surface roughness and surface absorption. So it's really related to the surface state of... Uh, of the waveguide. Um, so how to decrease the losses further? And there are two options, right? One, if you run the fab, which is for us, it's a bit out of reach, uh, you improve the lithography. You use e-beam lithography, you use uh, deep UV lithography and so on and so forth. And then you um, uh, uh, treat your surfaces, right? You try to smoothen it, um, and so on and so forth. Um, as a designer, you don't have access to the technology. You don't have access to smoothening the, the surface and so on and so forth. You resort to design, right? So we've discussed about this as well in the recipe of the loss that if you use wider waveguide, then your light is more to the center and then it touches the sidewall less, right? And then, of course, somebody mentioned about changing the waveguide shape to make sure that you don't touch this roughness of the sidewall. So yeah, what we learned from uh, yesterday is actually implemented in actual state-of-the-art silicon photonic fabrication and design.
Okay. The material that we use a lot is silicon nitride. It's a dielectric amorphous material with reflective index of around 1.9 or 2. Uh, and then it's almost always, not always, but most of the time, it's encapsulated in silicon dioxide. Why do we like this material? First and foremost is low loss. Second is high power handling. We discussed about two photon absorption. Nonlinear absorption that as you go higher and higher in intensity, you lose your light more, which defeats the entire purpose of existence, right? So um, this is not happening in silicon nitride. So uh, the, the fact that you can actually put a lot of power and then the material has high breakdown uh, power, let's say, so you don't damage the material because sometimes if you use high power, you damage the material. And then there is no two photon absorption. So that means that all the power that you put into your waveguide, in theory, can be used for your signal to noise ratio. The refractive index is moderate. It's not too low, it's not too high, such that you can still have compact um, uh, circuits, right? Relatively compact, right? Uh, has no nonlinear loss, as I mentioned before, and it has wide transparency window. I'm uh, uh, again contrasting this with silicon because then silicon is not transparent to visible wavelength, and there's a lot of application uh, now residing in visible wavelength. One, of course, is biological application, if you want to do sensing and so on and so forth. But now, uh, if you want to make uh, quantum computers based on trapped ions, you need to address these ions uh, at visible wavelength with ultra narrow line with lasers, right? So you cannot do that in silicon. You have to do it uh, in silicon nitride or other materials that are transparent for this kind of wavelength, you know, at the blue, at the red, at the UV, and so on and so forth. Um, the the, the nonlinearity, sometimes you want to have nonlinearity. Maybe you're familiar with nonlinearity, but then in very short, very hand wavy argument is that nonlinearity is indicated by uh, creation of new color, right? Creation of new wavelength. So that means that I enter with a certain kind of pump and then I can generate, uh, uh, you know, a frequency doubling, frequency halving. Uh, I can generate uh, mixing between uh, two different wavelengths. So two, two light waves interact with each other via the nonlinearity of the material, let's say. And sometimes you want to do that. Uh, if you want to create uh, light sources with many colors, um, you need to do that. If you want to create this green light, right, in this laser pointer, you do frequency doubling, right? So you actually have a, a nonlinear crystal here. And then, um, so what I was saying is that the nonlinearity in silicon nitride is moderate. So the nonlinear refractive index called N2 for care nonlinearity, third order nonlinearity, is actually 10 times smaller than silicon. So nonlinearity of silicon nitride is 10 times stronger than glass and 10 times weaker than silicon. So silicon is very nonlinear material. It's 100 times more nonlinear than glass, right? But people now still prefer silicon nitride because nonlinear effect needs a lot of intensity, right? And you can activate that by low loss. So the low loss uh, uh, compensate the moderate nonlinearity, such that in, 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 in one package, silicon nitride is still a better nonlinear platform compared to silicon. And of course, it has CMOS compatibility. So I, um, um, I borrowed this slide from a company called Ligentech, Light Generation Technology. This is a spin-off company from EPFL, a very prominent uh, you know, institution in Switzerland. And what they did is that they make silicon nitride waveguides with ultra-low loss. 
and then try to work with various companies, including uh, uh, quantum companies like uh, Sanadu, to actually make different products, right? LiDAR, biosensing, quantum computing, neuromorphic computing, all these hot topics now uh, people try to do it in sleep and night, right? Any questions so far? I'm halfway, right? Okay. Okay, so there are different flavors of silicon nitride waveguide. And these flavors are thick and not thick. Thick and very thin and something in between, right? So let me take it through this chart, right? So thick silicon nitride waveguide, what is thick is typically if you have thickness around 600 up, 600 nanometers and up, right? So this thickness can vary between 600 to 800, sometimes one micron. Um, why do you want to have thick silicon nitride? First, you want to make sure that all your mode, almost all your mode, so at least the strongest light distribution is in silicon nitride. If it's in glass surrounding it in silicon oxide, then it excess the characteristic of silicon oxide. But I want to use nonlinearity of silicon nitride, for example. Okay, I want to design my waveguide such that the most, the strongest intensity is in silicon nitride, and you need thickness for that, right? From the waveguiding point of view. The second one, you typically this is designed for single mode. Yeah. So strictly speaking, yeah, okay. There are other applications that you want to harness higher order modes. But then in this case, let's stick to single mode waveguide, right? So you have single mode waveguide that is thick enough such that all the light intensity, what matters anyway, is in silicon nitride. The second one that we've touched upon yesterday, but then it's not really deep, is that if you make silicon nitride thick enough, you can engineer the dispersion of the waveguide. Anybody remember what is dispersion? While I have a sip of water. Anybody? Dispersion idea? Yes, no? Should I just. Do you, do you want to answer it, probably? Yeah. Dispersion, yes. Yeah. So it's frequency dependence of the um, effective index uh, or how, how fast. So the different speed of different color, let's say. That is uh, a wavy uh, explanation of dispersion. So for some nonlinear application, you want to have a certain kind of dispersion, whether that is anomalous or normal. So whether red is faster than blue or the other way around, right? And the only the, the most effective way to do that in in in, in waveguide is to uh, engineer the thickness of the waveguide, right? So, uh, but then okay, it's desired. But what is the problem? As I mentioned before, making very thick silicon nitride layer is difficult, right? So let me explain. So there. Are, a, a, a number of ways to uh, create or to deposit silicon nitride. That is called, um, I'm not an expert in the fabrication, by the way, so I'm trying to be rather hand wavy. There is a PCVD, pressure enhanced CVD, chemical vapor deposition, where it, this is a process that is rather low temperature. So around 300 centigrade, 300 degrees or so. Uh, so it creates a, a silicon nitride layer that can be of uh, uh, yeah, substantial thickness, but the optical quality is low. So you have some sort of uh, absorption peaks because of this deposition method, such that if you make a waveguide out of PCVD in silicon nitride, the losses are typically worse than the other method. And the other me method is LPCVD, low pressure, uh, chemical vapor deposition. So it's low pressure, but then in elevated temperature, the temperature is around 800 
uh, degrees or so. But then because of this elevated temperature, um, the exact mechanism, I'm not sure. But then uh, what has been observed is that as you go higher than 300 nanometer, you have cracking in the film. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, let's say you have, okay, maybe for the Zoom audience, the question is that what sort of cracking that I'm talking about, right? In short. So, the idea is that, okay, you, you start with standard, right? You have a silicon wafer and you have silicon dioxide, right? And then you start here by depositing silicon nitride layer, right? Either via PCVD or LPCVD. For, for um, uh, LPCVD, uh, until a certain kind of layer thickness, this one is 300 nanometer, for example, this is still okay. But then, um, uh, as, as you go higher and higher, let's say, if you go to this, then you have cracks that is occurring in the, in the, in the layer, right? Of course, then if you have cracks, then you cannot use a lot of area of your, of your, um, of your uh, wafer. And why is that? Um, this is because there is a strong difference between the stress and strain, let's say, between the film of silicon uh, oxide or the layer of the silicon oxide and the silicon nitride. So you have some sort of shrinkage in the material that creates this kind of cracks, right? Starting from my uh, explanation that I need thickness to do dispersion engineering, good nonlinear optics, and then good uh, confinement, this presents a problem because then the thicker, the thickest that I can do. 300 nanometer. So that is a problem that is being solved by many, many, many people these days. So what they do, um, okay, again, a bit hand wavy, right? So um, as far as I know how to solve this problem, let's say you have, uh, let's say you have a wafer like this, right? So uh, this is just a top view, and then the side view, of course, is this silicon oxide, silicon wafer, and then you want to put silicon nitride here on top of this, right? What they did is that uh, they deposit silicon nitride, deposit, 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 until 300 nanometer, right? And then they turn the wafer. And then deposit, 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 and then they turn the wafer. So this kind of turning um, avoid the build up of the stress, right? And it has been shown that you can actually have pretty good thickness uh, using that. Or what they do is that, um, so I have to think. Okay, I don't know which step first, but then they, they, they make trenches or scratches in the in the wafer. So if there is a crack forming somewhere, it doesn't get to the other side. So of course you cannot use the entire area of the wafer, right? But at least you can save some part, right? And then there is called Damascene process, where instead of having the, the silicon oxide and then put a lot of nitrite here, what they did is that they etch a trench and then they fill layer by layer. Layer of silicon nitrite, layer of silicon nitrite, layer of silicon nitrite, and of course you have this and then they polish it, right? By chemical polishing. So you have a, a waveguide that is going into the substrate. This manage the stress, 
And then this Damascene process is now the way that is being implemented by Ligentech, those uh, logo EPFL and Ligentech, to make the best quality thick silicon nitride in the world right now, right? Uh, of course, they have a patented technology because the problem here is that if you fill layer by layer, you can have a hole here that you don't have a good filling of the silicon nitride into these trenches. But then they have perfected this. You are okay. And I'm doing a bit more, uh, <laughs> a bit more um, races to Ligentech as I wanted to do before. But then, okay, they have good waveguides. They have good devices in thick silicon nitride, right? The extreme, the other way around, is not to care about the silicon nitride at all, but relying on the silicon oxide. So this is the super thin silicon nitride waveguide, right? What is super thin? It's around 20 to 40 nanometer, right? So the silicon nitride there is just a token, a token of having a waveguiding layer and not more. So if you see that this mode is very concentrated in the silicon nitride, if you do nonlinear optics, you will access the nonlinear index of the silicon nitride. In this case, the mode is sitting in the silica, and silica can be pretty low loss. And that's the idea, right? So you make a waveguide that is very weakly guiding. This is also called dilute nitride waveguide. It's diluted, let's say, the silicon nitride. And then um, this super big mode and uh, it can be ultra low loss. Our partner Lionix makes different kind of waveguide that is a bit wacky, let's say. So they or we, they have this called so-called box-shaped waveguide. They also have a single stripe waveguide like the UCSB people. I have to mention that this from the UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara. And then a waveguide with two strip of course in the in the in the um, um, embedded in silicon oxide right so uh, I'm, I'm not going to go to, uh, very deeply into the wave guiding mechanism of this multi-core waveguide but then the idea is that the light is still guided in this silicon nitride layers but then of course there is interference between the light that is sitting on the top core and the lower core. So it forms a certain kind of blob of mode that sits some in silicon nitride and some in silicon oxide. And this has proven to be single mode with a certain kind of effective index, 1.6 probably the effective index, very can be made very low loss and can be made uh, in a compact circuit, right? And then you might ask, why do they do this, right? They do this to solve the problem of the stress of the nitride film. So the idea is that you, you have the silicon oxide and you build your silicon nitride until, I don't know, 200 nanometer, 150 nanometer. And then you put oxide again on top of that to reduce the stress, right? And then after uh, 500 nanometer or a few hundred nanometer of silicon oxide, they put nitride again. That cancels, cancels out the, the, the stress and so on and so forth, such that you, you have an effective thickness of the silicon uh, nitride, but then you don't suffer from the stress and the cracking. Well, Oh, maaf, boleh saya bertanya? Yo. Uh, untuk bagian sin silicon nitride, yeah. jika misalkan kita mau uh, memanfaatkan nonlinear effect, yeah. apakah dengan uh, banyaknya mode profile yang terdistribusi ke bagian uh, silika itu akan mengurangi efisiensi dari nonlinear conversion? Karena kan yeah. di, ya, sebagian kecil masuk di silikon nitride dan sebagian besarnya di silika. Ya, yeah, correct. Jadi pertanyaannya adalah, nah semua udah bisa dengar ya pertanyaannya. Um, jawabannya adalah betul. And I will switch to English. Yes, because then for this kind of waveguide, 90% of your mode or your intensity 
sitting in the silicon nitride, then you access the nonlinearity of the silicon nitride. For this one, there is no way you can do the same kind of nonlinear optics as this one because then this 99% sits in silica. So you access the nonlinear index or the nonlinear property of silica. In this kind of waveguide, the, the, it depends on the percentage of light intensity sitting in silicon nitride or silicon oxide. But you're right that the strength of the nonlinearity in this kind of double stripe waveguide is less than this. The dispersion is also different, right? So if you want to do frequency combs, one of the most exciting nonlinear processes these days that has been done in silicon nitride, you can do it here, but here you have to labor. You have to do extra to be able to generate the same kind of spectral profile. So the answer, in short, is yes. Terima kasih, Pak. Oh ya, sama-sama. Uh, okay. Boleh satu lagi, Pak? Oh yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, untuk di slide sebelumnya uh, bicara tentang silicon nitride, di mana dia uh, lebih sedikit loss untuk nonlinear effect, kemudian punya apa namanya power handling. Artinya kita bisa input power yang lebih besar. Hmm. Tapi lossnya kecil. Apakah berarti uh, apa tuh namanya untuk mengaktifkan nonlinear effect kaitri nonlinearity dari uh, silicon nitride juga tinggi. Jadi kalau misalkan powernya tinggi berarti untuk nonlinear effect kita butuh banyak uh, apa namanya input power dong. Berarti nanti untuk nonlinear effectnya apa namanya mungkin kurang efisien apa gimana gitu. Okay, so um, so let's say the strength of nonlinear effect in this case third order nonlinearity, right? Third nonlinearity uh, is proportional to let's say the nonlinear reflective index and two times the power that you put times the effective length of your material divided by the mode area, right? So this gives a recipe. If you now say that I want to do it in uh, this big waveguide, right? Oh, sorry, wrong direction. This big waveguide on the right, then this one is divided by 10 because it's much weaker, right? So you have to win somewhere else. Can you go longer? L effective is proportional to the actual length and some loss parameter, right? So if this is really low loss, then you just have to see whether you can have a factor of 100 in terms of the length and loss, right? So instead of having, I don't know, a uh, uh, 50 centimeter of waveguide, then you need to have tens of meters. Not gonna happen, right? The power itself, um, I think it's comparable. So you can put, so there is a paper from UCSB about five, six, seven years ago that they put eight watts of power into this kind of thin silicon nitride waveguide survive right we regularly put two watts into this kind of a uh, um, uh, double stripe waveguide survive and i think a watt has been put into the the thick silicon like that so i think they have comparable power handling so this depends on what you can put from your source right but then look at the a the mode area of this is much bigger than this one right so that means that this will go up and the total nonlinear coefficient or efficiency becomes really low for this material, right? So for that waveguide, you win in terms of the N2, you, may, you win in terms of the mode area, and then the losses is comparable. So for the double stripe, why it is difficult? Because then the loss is not as good as the other two, still right now foundry related the n2 is in between the n2 of silica or silicon dioxide and silicon nitride 
and then the mode area is in between the other two as well. So, but then th this is a useful guidance of how you can do nonlinear optics depending on what sort of waveguide that you have access for. Does that answer your question? Yeah, terima kasih, Pak. Sama-sama. Alrighty, I'm running out of time. Anyway, uh, okay. This is a chart made by Foundry just to show that they are doing the right thing, right? But then the message is that, okay, if you go thin to thick, your, um, uh, your, 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 the size of your circuit goes down, right? But then the losses is not linear as well. So what this Foundry is saying, which is a um, Lighten Tech, is that even if you have thick, uh, silicon nitride, you can also have low loss. That's it. Okay, so this is a chart putting where are the losses and the effective mode area, A, as I mentioned there in the, in the board, for these three different waveguides, right? So the effective mode area for this waveguide, the thick one, is an order of magnitude lower than the thin one or more, right? So then this one becomes 10 times smaller. So the nonlinear uh, uh, effect is, is stronger, right? The losses is comparable. So there is no order of magnitude difference between the losses. Uh, so you can look at, at this L effective, uh, but then the effective in the nonlinear index will be different. The double stripe, for example, is smack bang in the middle right, uh, in terms of effective mode area, um, and then uh, the losses are still higher, but then we believe that with new machines, new ways of uh, uh, annealing and so on and so forth, uh, Lionix and the University of Tante, uh, we are striving, let's say, to go down an order of magnitude in terms of losses. And we got the investment, and we need you guys to join us and then uh, work with us in this exciting venture of lowering the loss. Yeah, we are recruiting for more than 15 PhD students uh, already this year and next year, um, working on this particular problem, how to bring this star down comparable to the thick and the thin silicon nitride waveguides. All righty. Okay. Uh, we already talked about the PCVD and LPCVD. Um, yeah, so there's some absorption feature in the PCVD. So the losses of PCVD, silicon nitride typically is worse. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think we have discussed almost everything here. So this is just a comparison of silicon uh, oxide and silicon nitride again made by foundry in silicon nitride so it's a bit biased but um, you know you can access the short wavelength uh, the longest wavelength so some people wants to do sensing in the mid infrared because then there's a lot of absorption of gases there and so on and so forth uh, the problem not is not the material of silicon or silicon nitride but it's really about the cladding so glass is not transparent anymore beyond four micron or so. And then that's why you need to have a different kind of cladding, typically sapphire, aluminum oxide, let's say, to actually unlock the longer wavelength transmission of silicon and silicon nitride based waveguide. Uh, optical power limitation, there are tens of milliwatts typically because of nonlinear absorption. And then for silicon nitride is what? Distributed backscatter, is there anything? Yeah, okay. Temperature sensitivity. So silicon is a good uh, heat conductor, let's say. That means that you can, um, uh, it's much more sensitive to temperature variation. And silicon nitride is a bit more, you know, gentle so there's a factor of 10 in terms of the temperature sensitivity it's a good or a bad thing because later on you will see that we heat up our waveguide to tune the response of a filter of a ring resonator so uh, it's a blessing or a curse i don't know 
Uh, okay, let's move on. I have 20 minutes ish. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we can come back to this, but then the message is that with the double stripe silicon nitride waveguide, you can actually make highly intricate circuits with tuners, highly programmable. You can package it, you can interface it with electronics and so on and so forth. So this is already a mature material platform to build your circuit upon. I will come back to this kind of uh, slides later when we talk about programmable photonics next week. Uh, yeah, you've seen some of the figures. Okay, um, types of integration. So uh, as I mentioned before, you know, photonics now don't have a single material, preferred material. So you need to come with different kind of integration scheme to marry different material, right? Uh, so the, the single material approach is called monolithic approach. You have one material, let's say silicon or indium phosphate, and you build everything in this kind of material. But most of the time, you need to bring in different materials for lacing, for modulators, and so on and so forth. So you have to have either a hybrid or heterogeneous integration. A few weeks before coming here, I was in the PIC, Photonic Integration Circuit Summit of Europe, and there is a panel consisting of experts in silicon, silicon nitride, indium phosphate, foundries, people from the US. They line up seven people. And then it was moderated by uh, uh, Michael Lebby, who is a uh, person working in industry in integrated photonics. And then the first question to these people working in various platforms is that, how do you differentiate between hybrid and heterogeneous integration? No single same answer from these seven people. So my point is that um, the, the, this definition, let's say, can vary. <clears throat> so don't be confused if some say that, I think it's hybrid, I think it's heterogeneous. You get the point that it needs to involve multiple materials, right? Not a single material. My preferred version is like this. So if I have a chip, chip one, let's say silicon nitride, right? And I bring in a different chip connecting to that. This is indium phosphate, for example, right? Like this, so this is a top view, like this. This is called hybrid for me. Why? I prefer hybrid to happen at the back end. So in, in, in fabrication, there is a term called front end and back end. Front end, typically if you deposit material, you etch away material in the clean room and so on and so forth. Back end, if you already have the chips assembled. So if you have this chip, now this is a side view, silicon nitride or silicon, and then you put another chip on top of that, it's called flip chip bond. Yeah, you bond it, let's say. This is also hybrid, right? But if you start doing something funny, like I have silicon and then I try to grow other material in the clean room, and then etch away some part of the materials to structure it. So let's say having a 3-5 on silicon and so on and so forth. Uh, this is what I call heterogeneous integration. This is my personal opinion, which is shared by many. Now, I don't know whether it's shared by many or not. But then um, some people answer that, right? I put this slide. I didn't even read it. So... Heterogeneous is merging traditionally incompatible photonic material systems on a common substrate to exploit unique material properties. Hybrid is close integration of discrete photonic, exactly the same. Exactly the same. So hybrid is multiple chips. Heterogeneous is back end of putting different materials on top of other materials. Okay, great. So, um, so let's go through 
photonic integration, right? So um, in most photonic system, these are the things that you need to have. You need some sort of a light source, coherent light source. And then if you want to put information into this light source, typically you need to modulate the property of that light. You modulate the phase, you modulate the frequency, you modulate the polarization, you modulate the intensity or amplitude, right? After that, because you want to process the signal, sense it, you know, filter it, whatever you want to do, you need some sort of optical function. And after that, the light will end up either in a spectrometer or a spectrum analyzer or a photo detector, right? Everybody agree with this view? Okay, why not, right? So uh, the idea is that um, it's never optics only. It interfaces with electronics, either in the signaling, in the control of different function. It's controlled by an electrical signal, and also it's detected back into electrical domain. This is just reality of life, right? Um, so integrated photonics refers to integration of the photonics element. And this is already bloody difficult, right? As you've seen before, you need to go to multiple materials and so on and so forth. So, uh, but then later on, you will see that the vision is actually to integrate electronics and photonics in the same platform, right? Okay. So uh, this is, uh, Palex have seen this, this, uh, uh, a photograph from our lab. We call this photonic integration. Why? Because then um, uh, this part, the optical function, there's a lot of ring resonators. There's a lot of components. It's actually monolithically integrated in a single chip. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, may at least 10 ring resonators there. And the chip is here. So there is a chip with some fibers in and fibers out. And these multiple fibers connecting to these multiple waveguides will go to the laser, the modulator, the photo detector, right? So this is a modulator, which, of course, there's a chip inside and package, but then we prefer to box it because then some students will break it if we don't box it, right? And then there's a, another box that is also a photo detector. And there is this mysterious red box. Right, I think this group will go to, yeah, yeah. Some of us will go to a company in this city that produces multi channel power supply that can be controlled, that can be used to control photonic circuits. How exciting is that, right? A company in Bandung to produce this. This one we bought from Lionix, multi channel power supply that controls the behavior of this chip. This is the reality of integration in many labs, including mine. Okay, but we actually can do a bit better. This is hybrid integration. So you have a laser chip in indium phosphide, uh, but coupled into a silicon nitride processing chip, very similar to what you've seen before, and a detector chip in indium phosphide. And then you come in with uh, RF and DC electronics to control the entire chip and some optical fiber ribbon. So a bit better in terms of uh, integration. So um, the idea to go from that uh, uh, state of the art, let's say, is to integrate the electronics also on chip, right? So this is done by the group of Andrea Meloni in Poly, Polimi, Politecnico di Milano. And then the idea is that, okay, the photonic chip is integrated. Now the electronics is also chip integrated and they go with wire bonds to go from one to the other. It's a higher degree of integration, whether this is the best thing to do or not. Yeah, maybe there are better ways to do it. We will see. Uh, IMAC. IMAC did this flip chip bonding, right? So you have an uh, um, a photonic chip, right? And then they go with this kind of array of fibers 
into the into the chip similar to Linux, but they flip chip puff 40 nanometers 40 nanometer CMOS electronic chip to control the photonic functionality below, right? Higher degree of integration. Um, the vision now, some groups are pushing this a lot, is to do electronic and photonic integration in the same chiplet, right? Um, how, how do you do that? So this is a group in uh, ETH, uh, very prominent Einstein was there, I think, in ETH jury. Not anymore, I heard. <laughs> <It's>, it's, <yes. laughs> uh, but the, the idea is that they make very high speed modulator um, in silicon and then they do this kind of uh, integration in a single chiplet of the driver electronics, which is in bi CMOS, which is also in silicon, right? So this is even higher degree of integration. Uh, and then the most uh, uh, ambitious one uh, is pushed by IBM and um, uh, Global Foundries. And what they do is that they take the layer stack that is, has been uh, developed for electronics of Global Foundries and try, without changing the layer stack of the electronics, to make optical waveguide, to make ring resonators, to make modulators in that layer stack, right? And this is what is called monolithic uh, photonic and electronic integration. So if you take a look at the, I'm going to finish very soon. So um, if you take a look at the waveguide properties at 1300 nanometer instead of 1500, no problem. Uh, the propagation loss of these waveguides are 20 dB per centimeter, right? While the iMac one is around 2 dB per centimeter, uh, while silicon nitride, not a fair comparison, I'm just going to compare it anyway, is sub dB per meter, right? This is giving you orders of magnitude losses if you choose the different material. So if you want to have the lowest loss, go to silicon nitride. If you, have, if you want to have the most advanced tight integration be between electronics and photonics, you go to this kind of platform, right? But they address different challenges. So you cannot really say, some people said that, right? Some people just don't see the trees, the forest from the trees, and they say, yeah, just do silicon nitride. No, please don't do that, right? You do the silicon nitride spirals, long and nonlinear, and so on and so forth, for some applications that doesn't need this kind of super tight integration. You make a choice for this kind, and these numbers, believe me, will be better in the next few years. This will go down by order of magnitude, I think. People are smart, right? So this kind of snapshot of technology shows that it's possible, and then you can really integrate electronics and photonics, um, but it will get better. So that's it. I think that we don't get to the components part, but I think we're making good progress. Any question? Yes. 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 It's a problem. Yes. So heat management in this kind of uh, of uh, uh, structure, I think, is a problem, such that maybe you have a shift of resonance wavelength and so on and so forth. I don't know in detail whether they have addressed that or they already what is the impact of that, but then I would imagine that yes, um, it will be a problem. Yes. Oh, sure. Optical function. Yeah. Okay. So the question is that uh, about optical filtering, whether that is a type of uh, optical function, and what sort of filtering is it similar to the ones happening in electronics? The answer is yes, it's optical function. And then yes, 
Next week, I will talk about a field called microwave photonics, where in photonics, we are trying to mimic electronics filter, but better. Hopefully. Because then you can tune it better, you can program it better, and so on. But then, yes, it's like filtering in electronics. But, but there are two types of electronic filter. The first one is fully analog, so you really use resonators, microwave, and so on and so forth. The other one is lower frequency, digital filtering. Digital filtering is just delay lines that are being summed, and then you're creating this kind of interference pattern. Both can be mimicked in, electronic, uh, in photonics. Second question. Uh, tadi kan sempat dijelasin soal yang pasif sama aktif komponen. Yep. Uh, apakah ada kriterianya gitu? Gimana caranya suatu material itu bisa aktif, bisa pasif sama tadi kan dibilangnya itu ada material aktif yang dipakai buat pasif. Itu noises-nya itu gak bakal banyak? Eh, bakal banyak atau enggak? Ya. Yeah. Do I repeat the question? Okay. Um, the, 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 the definition of active and passive is dictated by the material. So, uh, you just don't emit light with the silicon nitride, but you do it with 3.5. Semiconductor is related to the band gaps and so on and so forth. So, uh, you can try to cheat. So, there was a group in Eindhoven that is trying to cheat silicon. They try to force silicon to emit light, right? But of course, right now it's still impractical, right? The second one is that if you do passive routing in active uh, uh, devices, let's say, whether you sacrifice performance, the answer is yes. Because then with typical losses in uh, active components like indium phosphide, you have a lot of scattering. Of course, they have amplifiers. So you can always say that Yes, I lose my light, but then I pump it again with electrical signal, and then you will have uh, back your light. But amplification is always noisy. So there is something called a uh, noise figure of an amplifier. What is a noise figure of amplifier? You come in with a signal to noise ratio, you come out with a signal to noise ratio. The signal to noise ratio at the output is always degra degraded if you use an amplifier. So yes, the noise property will be worse. Third question. Uh, tadi mengenai yang kayak tadi juga, sebenarnya kalau misal kayak aluminium atau baja, itu kan biasanya karena bendanya itu kontinum, yeah. kita kan bisa menggunakan term stresses gitu, strain, stress atau strain. Yeah. Tapi kan ini sebenarnya udah sampai ke micro atau bahkan nano gitu. Apakah sebenarnya cukup valid kalau kita mau ngomong pakai stresses atau strain mengingat asumsi kontinumnya itu bahkan kemungkinan udah tidak berlaku lagi. I think it applies. Still for this kind of solids you can actually think about uh, 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 if you press in this direction and what is the elongation in the other direction and so on and so forth if you if you stretch it what is the the change uh, relative change of uh, length when you compare it to to the actual length and so on and so forth. So I think it applies for these kind of materials. It's been widely used. So that I don't see that it doesn't apply for this. This is not super porous material where one is uh, very far from the other. It's not. It's still solid. Anything? Yeah, Pak Herman. Uh, di dalam apa uh, struktur waveguide itu yeah. uh, misalnya kita ambil saja untuk uh, semacam frekuensi conversion itu yeah. kan kelihatan menggunakan efek nonlinear ya yeah. nah tapi itu kan mungkin mempersyaratkan sumbernya harus cukup itu ya hmm. intensitasnya cukup besar ya yeah. nah sekarang mungkin nggak di dalam waveguide itu kita misalkan doping gitu ya yeah. misalkan dengan lantai night uh -huh. untuk apa jadi Uh, mungkin su uh, sumbernya itu tidak terlalu kuat, ya. tapi dia bisa mengkonversi ya dengan adanya lantai naik gitu ya. Aha. Atau bisa nggak? Misalnya kita masukkan kayak nanopartikel gitu ya, itu pernah dicoba nggak kayak kayak gitu ya? Ya, ya per aja sih sebenarnya. Ya. Pertanyaan yang luar biasa. 
uh, ya yeah, sekarang itu pad uh, oke okay. uh, silicon nitride wave guide ya yeah. silicon nitride wave guide seperti ini sekarang uh, uh, ada research yang aktif so oke okay. I will switch to English so for silicon nitride wave guide it has been doped with erbium so you put erbium ions right all over and then you launch your light signal at 1550 nanometer and then at the same time you launch 980 nanometer or 1080 nanometer to pump the transition of erbium to do energy transfer from this to that right so you actually make a waveguide amplifier so that means that if you have this kind of waveguide amplifier the source light that you have at 1550 nanometer shouldn't be i mean it doesn't have to be too strong right but of course this is now has been done in spiral waveguide where there is no nonlinear optics but then what they did and i know this because it's a former PhD student of mine that did, did this in a science paper earlier this year is that they have a ring that has nonlinear effect so they pump it with a single frequency and they create multiple frequencies frequency code and then they couple this into this spiral let's say that has been doped by erbium to amplify all these lines right the next idea is of course to dope the resonator itself like you said to actually exhibit amplification Does that answer your question? Terima kasih, Pak. Burning question. You won't see me until next week, right? So, <laughs> okay. Ada dari online nggak ya? Ada dari teman-teman Zoom yang bertanya. Oke. Okay. All right. Kalau tidak kita ucapkan terima kasih ke Pak David. Sekali lagi. Terima kasih, terima kasih Pak David. Dan sama-sama. Eh, sorry. Terima kasih Oke. Okay. Uh, sebelumnya jangan lupa tolong isi absensi ya. Hanya sekedar untuk uh, administrasi kita. Jadi kita tahu siapa aja yang ikut dan uh, kita akan lanjutkan dengan kuliah ketiga minggu depan hari Rabu. Pada jam yang sama di ruangan yang sama ya. Pagi ya. Siang. Oh siang. Siang. Oh, Oke. Okay. Ya. Kamisnya uh, oh. kuliah keempat hari Kamis baru pagi lagi. Oh Kamis pagi Rabu ya. siang. Siap. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. So we ya. will talk about uh, components, how to split light, how to uh, analyze ring resonators, and then hopefully transitioning to nonlinear optics. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Thank you. Sampai jumpa hari Rabu minggu depan. Terima kasih untuk kawan-kawan yang ada di Zoom. Kita jumpa lagi hari Rabu minggu depan pada waktu yang sama. Terima kasih. Saya Terima tutup kasih. Zoom-nya ya.